I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. And this is Currents. Who is Edith Stein? We'll get the story of her extraordinary life. She was always looking for the truth. And she said anybody who is searching for the truth is praying whether they know it or not. A creative and controversial way of reminding people of the reason for the season. And sounds of the season at the seminary. Every day we should be getting ready that Christ would be born in us. Well, good evening and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Exactly 69 years ago, President Roosevelt called it a date which will live in infamy. December 7, 1941, Japanese planes attacked Pearl Harbor, killing more than 2,000 people and drawing America into World War II. Well, that war produced many heroes, including a great number of saints, among them Edith Stein. But just exactly who is Edith Stein? Well, that question was answered this past weekend at Our Lady of Peace Church in Manhattan, where they performed a play about her life. And it was also an opportunity to bring Christians and Jews together during an especially meaningful time of year. We, we all await the coming of the Messiah, the Jews for the first time and the Christians for the second time. But it's the same, we believe the same Messiah that we're both waiting for. So we use this Hanukkah time, Advent time, to celebrate the lighting of uh, candles for representing the Jewish and, and the Christian faiths and celebrating them together rather than keeping everything split. Well, the St. Edith Stein Guild, of course, is devoted to Edith Stein, her works, the promotion of her life, and also interfaith relations between Roman Catholics and Jews. Edith Stein was born and raised Jewish. On a constant search for the truth, she earned a PhD in philosophy and became a popular lecturer and writer before converting to Catholicism and later becoming a Carmelite nun. During World War II, she was sent to Auschwitz, where she was executed. She was canonized in 1998 by Pope John Paul II. She wouldn't have been Edith if she hadn't been Jewish. And, and the more I read about her, the more I understood that her Jewishness stayed with her. I mean, that was part of who she was. After her conversion, her as a comma, like nun, um, this, this was part of who she is. People worship God in, in different ways, and there's truth in a lot of ways of worshiping God. Well, I think her main message, as she said, was uh, she was always looking for the truth. And she said anybody who is searching for the truth is praying whether they know it or not. And prayer is a lifting of the mind and heart to God, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So whenever, in whatever field we're looking for truth, working for truth, trying to spread truth, we're doing God's work and we're finding God in our own lives. We don't perform in theaters with curtains. I mean, 90% of the shows that Janet and I have done, we've often done them in churches. And it's very different. But churches are the place where theater happens. It, it, it is definitely a play for certain audiences. When we ask, who is Edith? And Jesus said, you know, who do people say that I am? And we have to ask ourselves, who am I? So it brings us back to ourselves and perhaps a moment to see where God might be moving in each of our own lives. Well, stay with us. There's much more of tonight's Currents just ahead. When we come back, a relative of Princess Diana is on the path to sainthood. We have that story and the rest of the day's headlines. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, celebrating the season with singing seminarians. And they sound so good. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. There are more developments in the already strained relationship between China and the Vatican. Just a couple of weeks after the government-backed Catholic Church ordained a new bishop without the Holy See's consent, reports say the government forced Chinese bishops to attend a meeting against their will. We have details on that from Rome Reports. Tensions continue to rise over the Chinese government's control over the Catholic Church in the region. 
According to Italian news agency Asia News, Catholic bishops have been forced against their will to Beijing to attend an assembly of representatives of Chinese Catholics. The report said, sources say, many bishops have gone into hiding or declared themselves too ill to attend the meeting. The report also said a bishop was arrested and forced into isolation. These alleged restraints on the Catholic Church would certainly not be the first time the People's Republic of China has disregarded the Vatican. The Vatican recently expressed its disapproval over the Chinese government's ordination of Reverend Joseph Gu Jinkai, who has served as a Catholic representative to China's parliament. Pope Benedict XVI called the ordination a grave violation of canon law and said China's actions hampered dialogue and reconciliation between the two parties. The government of communist China forced local Catholics to end their allegiance to Rome in 1951. Worship is only allowed in state-run churches, although millions of Chinese remain loyal to Rome and belong to unofficial congregations of Roman Catholics. Asian News said in its report that the contentious assembly has been postponed for four years because bishops, true to the Vatican, refused to participate. Well, in this country, a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard arguments Monday in a challenge to the California ban on same-sex marriage known as Proposition 8. Both sides say they will appeal if the panel rules against them. U.S. District Court Judge Vaughn Walker declared the ban unconstitutional earlier this year. Meantime, the U.S. Bishops' Conference has signed on to an open letter declaring marriage as the union of one man and one woman. Called the protection of marriage a shared commitment, the letter says traditional marriage is fundamental to the well-being of all society, not just religious groups. Also, leaders of the Bishop's Conference sent a letter to both houses of Congress today urging lawmakers to continue tax benefits for low-income families. Evangelicals are joining the U.S. Bishops' Conference in another cause, the START Nuclear Arms Treaty with Russia. The National Association of Evangelicals and the Bishops held a news conference this afternoon to call on the Senate to ratify the treaty. President Barack Obama and Russian President Dmitry Medvedev originally signed START back in April. It calls for both countries to begin reducing their nuclear arsenals. In the wake of several high-profile teen suicides linked to bullying, a new study shows parents play a crucial role in preventing their homosexual children from taking their own lives. The study was published in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Nursing and says homosexual, bisexual, and transgender teens with high levels of family acceptance have significantly higher self-esteem than those with low family acceptance. Christian pro-family groups, though, say that parents should love their children, but should not be forced to raise them contrary to their beliefs. Well, Monday was the feast of St. Nicholas, and members of the Greek Orthodox Church named for him used the occasion to file a lawsuit against the Port Authority. St. Nicholas Church was located across the street from the World Trade Center, but it was completely destroyed on 9-11. In papers filed yesterday, the church wants to hold the Port Authority to what they call the binding preliminary agreement the two sides made in 2008 to rebuild the church. Port Authority backed out of that deal and negotiations went on for years before breaking down this past spring. Well, in Great Britain, the great, great, great uncle of Princess Diana is one step closer to sainthood. The Vatican this week declared Father Ignatius Spencer lived a life of heroic virtue. Father Spencer was a passionist priest who died back in 1864. He was a convert to Catholicism from the Anglican Church. Reports say he was known as a great preacher who was at home with royalty as well as the poor. The Vatican still has to confirm two miracles attributed to Father Spencer's intercession before he can become a saint. And finally, in Massachusetts, thousands of people got into the Christmas spirit this weekend in hopes of making it into the record books. They attempted to set a new record for Christmas caroling. Dan Housel was there. Some came for the carols. I love caroling. I sing, I have my own shows that I do, and I also sing with the Victorian carolers. We'll be here in a couple of weeks. Some came to enjoy the holiday season. You don't just sing well at all. Just be here and enjoy the season. It's part of the festivities. And many, like 10-year-old John Rice, came here to break a record. It's been my lifelong dream to just break at least one world record. I, I always dreamed about it. And you want your name in the record books? Yes. 
You're only 10, so a lifelong dream for you is a big deal, huh? Yeah. John and thousands of others flocked to the Pru hoping to beat a record of 7,514 people singing Christmas carols for 15 minutes straight. Who better to lead them than Boston Pops conductor Keith Lockhart, a guy who leads hundreds of thousands for that little 4th of July sing-along on the Charles. Any trick to keeping 7,000 plus people on key? We'll see. <laughs> I don't think, I suspect there's nothing I can do about it, but as long as it's joyous, it doesn't really matter if it's on key. I'm not sure if they hit the magic number, but Keith Lockhart says, world record or not, he'll consider this event a success. The whole point of this is community. You get people out holding hands, singing Christmas carols. Uh, what could be wrong with it? In the end, the crowd of a little more than 3,200 fell well short of the record, but everyone seemed to have so much fun. Organizers are already talking about trying again next year. I love that they all got together, over 3,000 people. Could, can you imagine, though, if they were actual carolers that went house to house oh. with that many people? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a yard full of people, That I would think, be a whole a, new record. Or a, a stoop full of people. <laughs> Stay with us. There's more cards ahead. Just ahead, no, it's not the latest airport scanner, but it's got a lot of people talking. Welcome back. Well, it's hard to believe, but it's only about two and a half weeks until Christmas. It is hard to believe. And while we all try to deal with the commercialism of the season, uh, one advertisement in particular is raising a lot of eyebrows and stirring up some controversy as well. But it's not an ad for a store or for a product. It's actually an ad for Jesus. It started in the UK, but with the internet, it's now spread around the world. The ad was sponsored by a coalition of Christian churches. It shows a sonogram of a baby in the womb with a halo and carries the message, he's on his way. Well, joining us now to talk about the ad and the reaction to it is Francis Goodwin. He's the chairman of the organization behind the ad, churchads.net. Mr. Goodwin, thanks so much for taking some time out for us today. You're very welcome. Well, first of all, give, give us a little background about this ad, kind of where the idea came from and maybe where it's appeared so far. Well, the ad uh, came from a briefing to our creatives. We have some top London creatives who work with us, give their time freely, they're Christians. And um, they came back with three or four ideas. And when we saw this idea, we just went, wow. So it uh, immediately hit home. We thought, well, this is going to be a great idea. It's, a, it's another iconic poster uh, that, that will probably you know, be very famous for quite a long time. So we decided to work that up. That was back in the beginning of the year, February, March time. Well, has it, uh, has it appeared all over? I know it, it's uh, in the UK. Where, where has it appeared so far? It hasn't appeared anywhere on the street yet because its launch date is, uh, was yesterday, so it's just started gotcha. yesterday. But obviously we have to, to pre-sell it to churches because we, we don't have a huge amount of money ourselves, so we encourage people to donate to our website, and then uh, if we can, we'll place a, a poster in their town in the UK. Okay. Um, along with, and we also do radio advertising as well, so people can buy uh, local local radio advertising in their town or city. Sure. Well, I know a lot of organizations would uh, would be very grateful to have their ads create this much buzz uh, even before they appear. What kind of reactions have you heard so far? Um, well, we've had we've had a very very positive reaction from all around the world. In fact, uh, in your own city, I've had a couple of uh, Catholic priests been in touch with me um, so they'll be I hope they're listening to the show tonight um, and we've had uh, Catholics from all around the world Argentina Venezuela France Germany New Zealand all over um, it's particularly been uh, resounded with the Catholic community and uh, and that's quite interesting to us um, but uh, yeah I mean, some people are picking it up and running it in Spanish in other countries um, and uh, and people just picking it up off the web. Right. Well, a lot of uh, a lot of positive reaction there. Has there been any any sort of uh, negative reaction that you've heard so far, or has it been mostly positive? It's been, I would say, 90% positive. There are one or two people who've been trying to hijack it for a kind of pro-life agenda. And obviously, our our objective with doing this in the in Advent is to is to promote the unique humanity and divinity of Jesus. Uh, we're not uh, seeking to enter into a pro-life debate, and uh, some people have, have, I think, jumped on board the bandwagon, thinking it's a good, a good message for their particular angle. But that's not our intention. Right. 
Well, of course, this ad, uh, as we've said, has raised some eyebrows. And uh, but of course, your your organization doesn't only operate uh, during Advent and around Christmas time. Uh, any other plans for other similar ads uh, throughout the year? Give us a little bit of uh, an idea about what else you guys are planning. Well, we're, it's a, it's an all volunteer organization, so we have to be careful. We have to be good stewards of the time of the people that work with us. Um, so Christmas is the, is what we do every year. Um, this year we're going to be helping do it. We're launching an Easter egg, a, a Christian Easter egg, uh, for a, through a friend of ours who's who's done this, uh, done some work with a chocolate company, and so we're going to be helping him at Easter with some uh, poster work. And uh, as soon as Christmas is over, you, you might find this hard to believe. It's a bit like the stores. We start on next Christmas. <laughs> So we have a residential, we have a two-day residential in England. Uh, everybody comes together and we discuss the results of the campaign and then we work on a new brief for 2011. And it takes us, you know, typically takes us the whole year to get everything in place. All right, okay. Well, uh, yeah. This year may be a little bit different because we're, we're so, we've been very excited by the response and we may well run the same ad next year. Oh. So it may be that I'll, uh, one of the things I'm thinking about is whether we can link up with groups in, for example, America, Canada, uh, and see whether we can get a, a global campaign running for the first time. That's kind of that whole idea, if it's not broken, don't fix it there. Well, um, what is the message that you really want to leave with people? You, you said, you know, some people have been trying to, trying to turn it into kind of a, a pro-life thing, but that's not your, your goal, that's not where you're trying to go with this. What is the message that you want to leave with people when they see this ad? Well, if you look at it, when you mentioned the poster, you didn't mention the strap line. We have a strap line as well, which is Christmas starts with Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, at least a five-year program. We're into year two of a five-year program. So we're trying to remind people that, you know, every, everyone can have fun at Christmas, of course, but the, 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 the main reason for Christmas is to celebrate the birth of Christ. And so we're typically working, we're not working with people who go to church already. We're working with people way outside the reach of the church who never darken the door of a church, maybe don't know a Christian or don't think they know a Christian. So we're trying to, we always try to get something that they can talk about or, or muse over or talk over in the pub over a pint. Um, so it's designed to engage with them and then we hope, you know, we hope they will then go on and do something about it, find out more, possibly go to church. Et cetera, et cetera. All right, stir up some conversation there. Never a bad thing. Francis Goodwin, the chairman of churchands.net, thank you so much for joining us here today on Currents. We really appreciate your time. You're very welcome, and happy Christmas to everybody. Thank you very much. You, you as well. Thank you. Well, we'll have more about this over on our blog. Just head over to currentsny.net and click on Riding the Wave. In the meantime, stay where you are. There's much more Currents coming up straight ahead. When we return, it was choirs and carols in Douglaston this weekend. Finally tonight, it is not too early to get into the Christmas spirit or start up the Christmas music. You know, I've popped a few CDs there uh, that have some nice Christmas tunes on them, and they did just that last weekend out in Douglaston. Absolutely. It's not too early at all. It was the annual Lessons and Carols concert there at the Immaculate Conception Seminary in Douglaston with uh, several local choirs joining together with the seminarians to help spread the message of the season. Lessons and Carols is a focal point of our fall semester here. Tonight we try to encompass all four weeks of Advent all into one. And different song selections enable us to, uh, to experience those different aspects of the four weeks of Advent. Do not be afraid, Mary for you have found favor with God. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. To hear all these beautiful voices joining together, I feel blessed that I joined the Our Lady of the Snows Choir. It's just heartwarming, beginning to the Christmas season. The atmosphere of prayer was terrific. I think the music was right on, and I, I really think people went away with a good feeling for the Advent Christmas season. Every 
day we should be getting ready that Christ would be born in us. And so this was a way to do both, to celebrate Advent and Christmas. Child, the Christmas rose. The it's not really a difficult piece, but there's one note at the end which really is was somewhat high, and I said to myself, oh boy, this is really going to be difficult. And I hit the right note tonight, and you know, thank God. basically a program of wonderful young men contemplating a vocation and I think these men are so impressive they're our best um, advertisement when more people see them and particularly young people they say hey I could do that this year we had so many young men in the seminary choir 16 of them that we needed to combine choirs we had the choir from Our Lady of the Snows and the choir from St. Mary's in Roslyn because we needed the extra voices one choir of women could not compete with these men. We needed two groups to take them on. Great music. Absolutely beautiful. And uh, you know, I love the fact that you had the seminarian singing there. He's like, I hit the right note. Thank God. <laughs> I know. I say that to myself every time I sing. It's like, oh, I hit the right note. Thank God. Well, you do sing quite often. So what's your favorite Christmas carol? My favorite Christmas carol probably is kind of a little bit more obscure one. It's uh, Low How a Rose Air Blooming. Mm -hmm. I love that song. I did a choral version of it like in high school, I think, like ninth or 10th grade and have just been in love with it ever since. Nice. It's just, it's so beautiful and simple, but just gorgeous. What's yours? Uh, I kind of like Away in a Manger. Yeah. That's kind of my favorite, but uh, you know, I think we just, we, my mom still, even though she probably last took piano lessons in 10th grade or something like that, we all rally around the <laughs> piano and we'll just, you know, jam to whatever it yeah. is that she plays. If it's Jingle Bells <laughs> or the first Noel, we give it all a shot. It sounds like when my sister was taking piano lessons, she could, she like learned how to play one song. Uh -huh. And so that was, it was a hymn and that's what we'd always sing. Hey, it <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <That's right. laughs> well, that is it for tonight. Now, coming up tomorrow, a special show devoted to Mary. It's all for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and you surely won't want to miss it. In the meantime, though, remember you can always catch us online. We're over at CurrentsNY.net. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. And if you have an idea for a story, just drop us a line at our email address is drop us a line at CurrentsNY.net. Until next time, I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night.